Let me take your attention uh, today uh, for our time together to the first relationship. The first relationship, uh, we're going to talk to Adam. We're going to have a conversation with Eve. We're going to talk to Adam, and we're going to talk to Eve. We're going to see what they got to say to us in a minute. Let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. I'm going to read a considerable amount of verses, but I'm going to read them quickly so you don't fall asleep on me. I know you're sitting on your couch right now, and I know your pancakes are in hand, but hear me loud and clear. Uh, God has something for you. All right, here we go. Uh, the woman was convinced. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The woman was convinced, and she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it could give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her. He ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid. Somebody say they hid. They hid. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. I had a fear now because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree? Whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman. Well, yeah, he pointed the I'm going to tell you who it was. It was the woman who gave me the fruit. And I ate it. He said, ain't what I asked you. I asked you, did you eat it? I ain't asked you where you got it from. All right? Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? He said, the serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. Verse 15, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Go to verse 16. He said to the woman, I will sharpen pain of your pregnancy and you will desire to control your husband. That's what the text says. Hear me. There are many lessons that can be derived from the world's first relationship. Uh, but for the time that we share today, today, I want to preach from this thought. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever played this uh, game before uh, or seen this game before, uh, but whether you've been at a family event or on a cruise ship or watching on TV, uh, they have some shows about it. It's called The Battle of the Sexes. I've seen it for Battle of the Sexes. And, uh, and if you watch this show, you know, every now and then there, there, there's a man and there's a woman, there's some couples, and, and they're, they're answering questions or they're participating in, in a competition to see who can come out victorious, who can mm -hmm. win. And, and every now and then I've seen this show, and particularly the in-person moments have really blessed me, Pastor Chris, because every now and then I'll see a man answer some questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I will know, man, mm -mm. they won. But he lost. He lost. <laughs> I've seen some moments, and I said, mm. he, thought he, he thought he won a competition. But what he about to have is a conversation. Wait till he get home. Wait till he get home. And I'm not, I'm not judging him because I've been there before. I know that there's some times in my relationship where I won the moment, but I lost the night. I wish I had some men that say amen in the chat right there. I, I, I lost the night. I won the argument, but I lost unity. Yeah. Right. I, I won the opportunity, but I lost connection. Yeah. And in this age old wrestling between the battle of the sexes, between man and woman, between uh, our relationships. And hear me today, even if you're not in a marriage, uh, uh, these principles are true to any relationship that you are in. You need to understand what the enemy wants above all else is you to live into battling versus building. He wants you consistently in a battle so that you are not effectively building. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And it's in this context that we have to see the trick of the enemy. We have to see this seed and this strategy that comes against us having healthy relationships at every level of our life. Because if we don't process the pattern, we repeat it. Right. And for many of us, we have not processed the pattern. Now, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I want to give you this thought because I think one of the reasons we don't effectively process the pattern of unhealthy relationships, un 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 process the pattern of battling versus building is because we love the idea of God being a potter when it's personal, uh -oh. but not when it's relational. Wow. Wow. 
Look at what it says in Jeremiah. I want you to see this here. Jeremiah 18, it says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. And so he went down to the potter's house. He saw him working on the wheel. And it says that while he was working on the wheel, there was a pot that was shaping in the clay that was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with Israel as the potter does? Like the clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand. Hear me. That was a communal declaration, not just a personal one. And here's what I've come to find. Many of us love the idea of putting our vision on the potter's wheel, but we don't like putting our relationships on it. We say, God, mold, mold this, but don't mold that. God, I'll give you this to put your hands on, but this one I'll take over for myself. Uh, there was a young woman who was a part of our launch team many years ago uh, while she was a college student, and she was in school for pottery. And, and, and she came and showed us one time what it meant to, to, to create something on a potter's will. And what was interesting about her is that she began to explain to me, Vernon, the process of, of, of actually molding clay requires that I am not frustrated when I have to keep restarting because often when you are shaping it, you have to push it back down and break what you have built so that you can build it higher. And that actually what you see as the outcome is the process of multiple times breaking it so that you can build it, breaking it so that you can build it, breaking it so that you can build it. Here's what I want to come and tell you today about building healthy relationships. You cannot build what you won't break. And this is why many of us have been frustrated. Why are none of my relationships working out? Because you won't break attitudes. You, you say, God, I want you to build this thing. And he says, cool, can I break some things? You say, God, I want you to build our unity. He said, okay, can I break your, your bitterness? Can I break your resentment? Can can I break your communication issue? You, you say, it is what it is. That's just who I am. He said, can I break that? Because in my hands, it doesn't have to be who you are anymore. But the challenge for many of us is we want God to build something, but we won't let him break something first. I wonder today what God could build out of our lives if we allowed him to break some things. First. We really submitted our hearts our hands, our relationships to the will of the potter. And the text tells us that Adam and Eve in this first relationship are, are, are the prototype for what it means to have a healthy relationship. They're walking with each other, but more importantly, they're walking with God. They're walking with God and they're walking with each other. And then steps another opinion, another voice, another idea. I'm not going to make no eye contact right now, but I wonder, has anybody ever had a good thing and then allowed another voice to come into it? And you're trying to say, where did this come from? We were doing so well. So good. But the moment we let some other voices start getting in our ear, we found ourselves now apart from God and distant from each other. And I'm here to say today that the Adam and Eve Show us, come on, we often learn from what people did, but we also can learn from people what not to do. Yeah. That, that, that as we are building healthy relationships and becoming healthy people, we have to understand that while we're on the potter's wheel, it is inevitable that the enemy is going to send voices and send ideals that seek to pull us out of walking with God and walking in unity with each other to ultimately push us into battling versus building. How do I know they were building? Because their first assignment was to build the Garden of Eden. He said, I want you to plant, multiply, be fruitful. All these things are happening. They got dominion. They were building something in Eden and it all got broken. And the text says, because now the battle began. Control issues began in the garden. The division began in the garden. Hostility, the text says, was the outcome of the garden. We are seeing now the fruit of the fall. And in all of this, I thought it was so interesting that when Adam begins to have a conversation with God, he starts talking about a word that I didn't expect to see in the text. Like I expected regret, I expected apology. I expected, it says he was afraid. He was afraid. And I think if we be honest, fear is at the foundation of most of the stress in our relationships. 
And I think if we look closely, there are three fears we must face that often ruin relationships. Three fears that often ruin healthy relationships. Hear me, not just for marriage, it just pops up in every relationship. Somebody say every. every. Okay, okay. So here's the first one. Here's the first one. The fear of exposure makes me distant. The fear of exposure makes me distant. I got, I got to tell you something. Guess what? This is about you, not your neighbor. This is about you. You don't like everything about yourself. True. If most of us be honest, there's a part of us we don't like. No judgment. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody got a little part of themselves that they want to work on. Everybody got a part of themselves that they want to be better. Here's what the enemy does, though. The things you don't accept about you, you don't want others to see. And so what the enemy does is plays on the area you're trying to develop. But what God says is development comes by way of community. But if you can't let people see it, they can't help you develop it. <laughs> and so the fear of exposure makes you distant. Brene Brown says this in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Authenticity is the daily practice of letting go who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. Choosing authenticity, watch this, means cultivating the courage to be imperfect. And last month, to set boundaries, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and exercising the compassion that comes from knowing that we are all made in the tension of strength and struggle. Hear me, it's okay to be in strength and in struggle. Let me help somebody in this way. It's okay to be both strong and weak. You know how I know? Because Jesus was. He had the strength to conquer the grave and the humility and the vulnerability to stay on the cross. He was both strong and weak. And here's what the world has told us. That your vulnerabilities, that the areas of your life that will be exposed, you say, no, 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 I can't show nobody those. And so you make distant what you don't want to be exposed. And distance is dangerous because where there's distance, there's very rarely development. So you're trying to hide every flaw. You're trying to hide every insecurity. You're trying to hide every place. And then you're trying to figure out why is this not growing? And why is it that we're not talking about this? And why is it that I feel insecure when they turn to the left just too much? Why is it that I feel uncomfortable? When they said this, and I'm not trying to, they didn't say a big statement, but it made me feel a certain way. What is happening in me, but I'm not addressing it. I am distancing myself because I don't want to seem weak because I don't want you to see what I'm really feeling. And look at what Adam said. He said, I was afraid and I did what? I hid. God asked two questions. Where are you and what are you hiding? Distance. God, I'm hiding from you. And what the enemy knows is not only does this show up in your relationship, but you also are an expert often at hiding from God. Ain't it crazy that the one who has the ability to shape us into a better version of ourselves, we hide from? <laughs> well, God, you know, just, Lord, you're so kind and, you know, you're faithful. You know, he's like, I know I'm faithful. Let's talk about what you've been hiding. Some of God's prayer lives full of his promises and not our brokenness. What have you been hiding? <laughs> Hear me. We have to overcome this fear of exposure because it makes us distant. Distant from God and distant from people God is trying to use to help develop us. Here's the second fear. The fear of disapproval makes us defensive. This one's going to hurt 12 people. Put it in the chat. Be like, ooh, ooh, ouch. Makes us defensive. So watch this. When we are afraid of disapproval, we move from hiding to hitting others. Okay, don't worry about it. I'm going to hit back. Right? Yeah, look at Genesis 3 and 12. He said, he said God says, uh, what did you do? Did you eat the fruit? He says, the woman. <laughs> She did it immediately. 
Watch this. Don't miss it. He pointed to her. What did she say? The snake. We're going to find somebody to point this finger at. Anybody's going to take the blame but me. Right? And, and we, we grow into this habit of learning that, oh, my God, the moment I feel like somebody's disapproving of me, I have to defend myself. Right? So, so, so this is how it shows up in a relationship. We keep an imaginary scoreboard. Yeah. <laughs> keep an imaginary scoreboard. And so, and so we don't tell you about it until we feel like. We're about to be disapproved of or, or lose in a moment. Come on, you've been in a conversation before, and the conversation's going well, you think. And they say, I just want to let you know about some things that I'd like you to do better. And I just want to give you some thoughts about, like, ways in which we can improve. And instead of you taking the feedback for development, you take it personally and say, oh, you disapprove of me. Oh, don't worry about it. I got a list. <laughs> Of some things that you didn't done and the way you didn't said, what you didn't watch this. And when this happens, we calculate wins and losses, and it never works because it turns our relationships into battles instead of buildings. Hear me. I need all of us to get to the point where we say, I care so much about what God is molding in this relationship or in me that I'm not here to win the argument, I'm here to work. What is God calling you to work on? And you can't build the way he's called you to build because you're busy battling to win. And while we're fighting each other, the enemy's winning the battle of our hearts. He's winning the battle of our thoughts. He's winning the battle of our future. He's winning the battle of our kids because they're seeing relationships be toxic. And then they carry traits into the next generation. Hear me. And we got to make up in our mind. No, I'm not here to win an argument. I'm here to work on a relationship. This is not a battle, baby. This is an opportunity for us to build. We got to build enough is enough. And if we don't process the pattern, we repeat it. Watch this. The fear of disapproval makes us defensive. The fear of exposure makes us distant. Here's the last one. The fear of losing control makes us demanding. Look at what verse 16 says. He says, and you would desire to control your husband. Now, I'm not here to try to talk about uh, 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 sexism or to try to get into gender uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, uh, you in your home, figure out what the appropriate responsibility is. That's fine. I just want you to see the context at the beginning of the battle between man and woman starts in the garden. And look at what it says. It said there's going to be a control battle from the beginning. Which means the only way you're going to overcome it is to submit your life. This is why Ephesians tells us to submit our lives to one another. So that we don't, watch this, fight for control, demanding of each other something. God said, no, no, no. That was never the rhythm that I called a healthy relationship to live into. And watch this. They lost destiny, they lost future, they lost paradise trying to be in control. And the more out of control I feel, the more controlling I become. Well, some of us can be honest and say the more you start feeling out of control, the more you start trying to hold on to stuff. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Kids out of control, come here. Life out of control, come here. Job situation out of control, I'm going to make this happen. A door doesn't open, I'm going to open that door. Yeah. The more out of control you feel, yeah. the more controlling you become. Yeah. And ultimately, what we tell God is that I don't trust your hands enough oh. to mold something beyond my abilities. Yeah. God, do I trust you or no? Or no. Fear of losing control. Makes me demanding. So I start demanding stuff of people. I start demanding stuff in my relationship. I start demanding. Watch this. That ain't even their job. Because I feel like I'm losing control. Watch this. Here's the antidote. Can't leave you by, by yourself. Here's the antidote. Real simple. First John 4 and 18. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. I'm going to read two passages for you really quick. 1 John 4 and 18. Here's the contemporary English version. A real love for others will chase those worries away. The thought of being punished is what makes us afraid. It shows that we have not really learned to love. 
Now, when we find God's type of love, we're able to overcome worry. I don't want to make this sound judgmental. Hear me, y'all. Everybody battles with worries in relationships. But it allows us to chase those worries away because we're learning how to love like God. And wherever God's love is, it pushes out fear. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever done this before. Have you ever not told the truth because you were afraid of the consequences? Have you ever not fully been yourself because somewhere? Because you didn't know how they would take you. Have you ever held back on stating your true convictions because you didn't know how someone would respond? <laughs> Watch this, one more. Have you ever held back on sharing the truth with someone because you were afraid of losing them in your life? And all of these just illuminate for us that in any relationship, we are constantly living in the tension of fear. Never really showing up fully as ourselves or in our full truth. And we're suffering because of it. And the health of the relationship is suffering. Because, and God is asking us, why have you hidden? Where are you? One last verse. We're going to end with this. Job 11, 13 through 18. Watch this. Job 11, 13 through 18. Contemporary English version. Here's what I love. Here's the way to overcome it. He says this, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Then you will not be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge and your darkest night will be brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. Three practices, eight promises. Three practices, eight promises. Surrender, turn to him, give up your sins. And what does he promise us? He promises us that we won't be ashamed. We'll be confident and fearless. Our troubles will go away. It says that our darkest night will be brighter than noon. That you will rest safe and secure, filled with hope emptied of worry here's what the enemy is banking on the enemy is banking on your fears controlling your heart for the rest of your life your fear to be honest your fear to be uh, uh, honest about who you are where you are what you feel and so what happens over time what happens what happens the fear of exposure keeps making you distant from people who want to love you but you keep building walls where you should build bridges because if they really see me, they won't love me. Fear of disapproval makes me defensive. So people who do love you enough to tell you what they see and are trying to help you build, you battle with. Because you feel like you got to win the moment. The fear of losing control makes me demanding. Because really what I'm doing is trying to keep control. Instead of saying, God, I surrender to you turn to you in prayer and give up my sins, anything that separates me from you. And the rest of the promises are on you. I won't be ashamed. I'll be confident. I'll be fearless. My troubles will go away. Your darkest night will become brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope, emptied of worry. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for us. Three practices, eight promises, because enough is enough. If you don't process the pattern, 